Hi there, I'm Pamela Ambler. Welcome to I See Your Trade, which we are recording today from the tech capital of the world, Silicon Valley in California. In this episode, how to pick the billion dollar companies. How can you spot these companies before they become unicorns? What are the hallmarks of these fast growing companies and how can you tell the potential unicorns from the donkeys? The world's biggest company, Apple, as well as Google or Alphabet and Meta, previously known as Facebook, have all grown from humble beginnings in Silicon Valley to become billion and even trillion dollar companies. IC Your Trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high performance trading provider. Trade up to IC Markets. Today I'm joined by Bill Tai, venture capitalist and early investor in Zoom and Canva. Thank you very much for joining us today, Bill. Thank you for having me. You've been called the world's greatest venture capitalist. If you can pinpoint one thing, what is that one thing that makes you the best VC on the planet? Well, best is subjective, but I would say that I'm probably one of the most fun venture capitalists to work with. And that brings me a lot of deal flow. So I have a lot of projects to choose from. And, and let's rewind now and have a look at how it all started. You moved to Taiwan to help at the start of what would become Taiwan Semiconductor, which is now among the 10 largest companies in the world in, in terms of market cap. You went to Taiwan in 1987. How old were you then? And did you have any idea at the time the company would get this big? I was in my early 20s and I had no idea. I, I knew that there might be an opportunity for Taiwan to enter the business and compete with the Japanese, but I didn't know that they would win. <laughs> now, Taiwan Semiconductor makes chips for Apple and Android computers, as well as smart devices like iPhones and iPads. What did you learn at Taiwan Semiconductor that set you up for a career picking winners as a VC? Well, the semiconductor business, if you are a manufacturer, is crazy because you literally today have to put down 10 to 12, maybe $20 billion to build a building, equip it, and then you're going to sell $5 to $100 devices. So you have to go after very big markets. And I think bigger markets produce bigger outcomes. So from day one, I was oriented to find me a market that can do volume. Right. Now, you're a keen kite surfer. Um, I read somewhere that 70% of the companies that you invest in share a love for the sport. What is it about kite surfing that makes it a parameter for corporate success? Well, it draws a certain type of entrepreneur if you're doing a startup. If you think about the sport of kite surfing, it's a very complex sport with a lot of moving parts, a giant multivariate equation. And you're trying to handle wind and water and gear design and a lot of power and you're essentially failing 99% of the time while you're learning and taking a lot of abuse until that one magic moment where it comes together and you can ride and fly. So the entrepreneur that is willing to do that is the kind of mind that is great for startups. I see. Now, uh, you invested in Canva uh, and saw its valuation peak at roughly $40 billion, but you met the co-founder, Melanie Perkins, who took up kite surfing herself so she could meet you. Is, is this a prerequisite to pitching? Uh, must be able to kite surf? <laughs> you know, it just so happens that my network is full of people that like that sport. Back in the, I think the 2000, early 2000s or so, um, I had actually retired 22 years ago after I had a, a, a big run in the 1990s during the internet wave. And I took off some time, learned to kite, and I became a sponsored athlete. And uh, somewhere around 2003, I think, it was uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page were spotted in San Francisco Bay learning how to kiteboard. And suddenly every entrepreneur wanted to learn to kite and they didn't want to go to those two because they couldn't, <laughs> so they would all come to me. And it formed this amazing circle of really interesting people that were just well-timed, you know, just it, with Web2, uh, wanting to go for it and learn. And that became my circle and a lot of the people I invested in. Incredible. Now, what did you like about Canva? Was it the idea? Was it the passion of the founder or a shared love of kite surfing? <laughs> you know, it was actually all three of those in a, in a little bit of a mix because I think, uh, as I mentioned before around the semiconductor topic, I'm very drawn to investing companies entering very large markets where there's a structural change. Right around that time, I was convinced that cloud would be a thing, and this is kind of 2011 to 2013, 
The companies that I backed at the time were like Zoom for cloud video, uh, Canva for cloud design, Treasure Data for cloud Hadoop. You know, there was a, a wish for cloud shopping, you know, so I could see the structural change coming to cloud and mobile. And to me, Melanie represented that. Uh, and she just had a lot of spunk. I mean, she's a fiery, charismatic, driven person. I wasn't really sure that she could do it, uh, and she wasn't a coder. So when I finally was able to get uh, Lars Rasmussen, the inventor of Google Maps, who had built that whole operation in Australia, to meet with her and ultimately source a coder to build it all, build out her vision, that's when it was time. So it's, you know, it's market, people, timing, energy. Now, you were also an early investor in Zoom. During the pandemic, uh, Zoom's valuation exceeded 100 billion US dollars and you invested before the pandemic. Uh, did you predict something like a pandemic would happen or did you just get lucky on timing? Well, you know, so people forget that Zoom had already gone public in 2018, a couple years before the pandemic. And even at that time, they were not a gigantic business. They were running around 300 million in revenue at 80% gross margin and 30% operating before the pandemic. So it was already a good business. But what I saw in that was the structural change in the market of how you could handle video in the cloud. Rather than kind of a point to point system where a lot of the stuff has to get handled in your computer. And if, you, if in the old architectures of things like Skype, if you wanted to have 10 people on a call, you would basically have to generate that in your computer and send 10 video streams to 10 different places. So you'll notice that Skype never really scaled very much. In Zoom, it goes one entry point into the cloud, replicates inside, and you can scale infinitely tens of thousands. So I knew that the architectural vision that Eric had was going to be a better solution. I just didn't know when. And I knew it was a big market, so I was willing to take that chance when Everybody else told me I was a knucklehead to try to have a company competing with Google and Microsoft with free products, but it worked. It's always for me, in the end, you have to have an entrepreneur that you really trust and believe in because companies are really just piles of people that have that share a common uh, culture. And somebody that can set a, a great culture is durable across any market. They can change products, they can change markets. You, you have to build an organism that is durable. And Eric was the core. Now, uh, you have uh, also literally invested in hundreds of companies. What is the one that gives you the most personal satisfaction? That's a hard one. Um, you know, I, there was a company that, that lived for a while in the 90s that was magical, um, but got beaten up by Intel. And it's a company called Transmeta. But in that company, I had the inventor of the RISC microprocessor, which is the modern architecture that all microprocessors use today. I had Linus Torvalds, who was writing our compilers. We had engineers that had created Quake and Doom. And it, it's a very technical company, but we basically virtualized Intel's x86 and turned their instruction set, which is a very complicated kind of just rows of instructions, into a, a set of instructions that were broken apart, run through parallel machines with the answer then reconstructed um, without violating any of their patents. And we were able to, to create a microprocessor that burned one watt, not 140 watts, which is you know, enough to burn your lap with a laptop. So that, that chip got put into pretty much every laptop in the mid 90s, but ultimately Intel's marketing dollars crushed us. You're friendly with Sir Richard Branson, who incidentally also is a keen kite surfer, and he helped you get your worldwide startup competition, the Extreme Tech Challenge, up and running. It's focused on bringing potentially world-changing technology to the forefront. Has this competition unearthed any gems? Uh, you know, Canva, while I had met the entrepreneur, they entered the first year. And uh, so, yes, absolutely it has. And there are, I think we see something like 4,000 entrants a year now. And we've pointed the contest at uh, sustainability. So we are seeing companies in every field you can imagine that produce, you know, kind of cleaner, better food for people, um, economic empowerment plays in finance, 
Uh, it's just a wonderful contest for, for what this world needs today. And uh, clearly you're very good at picking successful entrepreneurs. What sort of qualities should investors be looking for in leaders of businesses they think of investing in? You know, for me, it, it boils down to integrity because you have to really trust the person. And when you're starting, my, my sweet spot is what I think a lot of people would consider risky, but I don't at all, which is give me like a one or two or three person company that has a low burn that is seeking its shot. And I, I basically work with the entrepreneur to, to figure out where, what that shot should be so that they do it efficiently. And when you're working at that early stage, you really need somebody that you know you feel like you could be married to because it's gonna be at least 10 years, more like 20, as you're building you know, on this very long-term horizon. So it's integrity, it's energy, it's uh, kind of an aura of charisma that can draw the resources you need for a little seedling like that. You know, capital, money, partnerships, um, so it's, it's that. Mm. And do you prefer to invest in founder-led companies rather than appointing uh, CEOs who climb the corporate ladder? I typically start at that very early stage where I'm helping the entrepreneur in the formative stage. And so for me, it's very much about the founder. And now there are definitely times when companies get a little bit bigger and they have to operate differently and you want to bring other management. It doesn't have to be the CEO, it can be people around it, but uh, I think the higher gun CEO, very appropriate for later stage, but I typically like to build around a founder. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is more important, the idea or the person behind the idea? Absolutely the person. I think person, culture, values matter the most to me. And what's the company you invested in that has delivered the best financial return for you. What was it about the company that made it so good? You know, I'd say Zoom and Canva are right up there uh, uh, together. And I'd say it's a combination of massive, massive market that has, uh, you know, each of those companies got massive reach and they have business models that are beautiful. You know, kind of 80-ish percent gross margin, 30% pre-tax mar uh, margin numbers and very scalable. So that type of uh, financial profile with high growth can produce the kinds of valuations you saw with a little bit of low interest and, you know, bubble. You can get over $100 billion in market cap. Got it. And obviously money now is no longer the driver. It's perhaps uh, that it once was for you now. So now what is it that drives you in terms of investing? Is it something that's more altruistic, like changing the world. How important is legacy to you? You know, I think, so it, weirdly enough, it, for me, it was never about the money. <laughs> it was about the creative process and seeing really cool, interesting things come to light. And I think over time though, it is very much the case that I shifted from things that were kind of technically better and more interesting at maybe the device level than semiconductors or a faster router or switch or hub for communications or you know things that were higher price performance um, as i got older and more cognizant of the issues that this planet faces i can't think of a company i've invested in the last 10 years that isn't about trying to make the world a better place and uh, what are the big growth um, or themes that you think of um, when you think of transforming the world? I think we're in a really fascinating stage of technology where, you know, when I started, my products or, and the work that I did was about moving electrons around a little more efficiently on little pieces of silicon and then into boxes. And then I think it became less about moving electrons and moving the information when the information superhighway came out. You know, the internet was really about uh, more efficient ways to move the information that was represented by those electrons. We are now in an era where the information represents assets. So it's not electrons or information, it's the assets themselves. So as you think about, you know, companies like Google that are organizing the world's information, blockchains and the kinds of things that you hear about in Web3 are reorganizing the world's assets. And 
assets compared to information, you're not like moving something to get a click for a few, few cents. You might be moving a house or a car. So the dollar value of the click is moving from pennies to thousands of dollars. You're gonna get things that are two to three orders of magnitude larger than Google in this wave. So that's pretty exciting to me. And how do you know immediately that an investment is likely to be a miss? What are the pitfalls to look out for? Those are usually market issues. And uh, you know, I had, I had the great, great benefit. In the first startup I was actually in, LSI Logic, um, in Silicon Valley in the 80s, on our board were Don Valentine that started Sequoia and Tom Perkins of Kleiner Perkins and IVP was the third investor. I, I started to follow Don around in the early days of my, my venture career and the thing I learned from him was always, always, you have to be very, very aware of the size and timing of a market. You have to get that part right Otherwise, the other barrels don't matter. And what are some of the companies that you've been pitched to, but you turned down and perhaps now regret not getting involved? Well, you know, I have to say, I never really regret, <laughs> regret anything, you know, like that, because it's like, you just, you just can never tell. But I did have the honor of passing on the creation of Ethereum with Vitalik because I was already kind of working with what at the time was the world's largest Bitcoin mining operation in Bitfury. So I was like, well, you know, and then I had, uh, I had the great honor of passing on Pixar with Steve Jobs, wow. which, you know, who, who to know, you know, but uh, <laughs> somebody knew, but not me. And a final word of advice, uh, can an average person begin to think and make investment decisions like a VC? Uh, is there a checklist? that they should follow. You know, as I've talked a lot about markets, life is a lot like that, right? You can spend the same amount of time on something that's a little impact or a big impact. So it's kind of simple. Just spend all your time on things that if they work, it's a big impact. You know, so every decision I look at the same way. What's, what's going to be the most efficient use of my time on something that is signal, not noise, that can be a, a, a big move the needle outcome. Wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining me, Bill Tai, the greatest VC in the world. The funnest VC in the world. Thank the funnest you. VC, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. You've been listening to IC Your Trade. IC Your Trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high performance trading provider. Trade up to IC Markets.